instruction given to the pair of Eden was to dress or address the garden. Doing so would have allowed them to grow familiar with the mind inspiring that garden. They would have grown familiar with the author of that garden. And that's all we have been doing, following that instruction of dressing or addressing the garden. And all that has been uncovered is the author's mind. We're seeing the character John zoning in on John as an example of what it means to dress or to address the garden. And we're seeing a lot connected to John, a lot associated to John that we would never think due to our not dressing or addressing the garden. And so continuing with that, that theme of dressing and addressing the garden of our belief and examining and examining in on John, there is something that John says that's completely relevant, that is completely relevant to why they are also in that narrative. And it has to do with the unlatching or the latching of a shoe. Mark chapter one, Mark one, seven and preached saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Why is this here? Is this simply something that the author is saying to enforce a bit of a commendation, a bit of reverence to the one that is to come after, the one that is mightier than this initial character, John? Why is this here? Could there be another reason that this is here? There actually is another reason. There is, There are two reasons. There are two reasons of which we are going to get into for why this is here. And when we see how they line up, we can see more of the, the sort of entrailed vision that the author has. Turning to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 5, 26 to 30. Let's pay attention to some key words. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. Whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses hoofs shall be counted like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens, in the heavens thereof. This reference to the shoes and to the latchet, it is a reference to this. Why is John not fit to loose or unloose the shoes of the one mightier than him that will come after? Well, the reference, the reference is to something very dark. The reference is to something very dark. The reference alludes to a host or to an assembly whose shoes latchets will not come undone, meaning that they will tread, they will tread due to their power wherever they are supposed to tread, however they are supposed to tread. And not only are they just doing this to do it, this is actually a bit of a mandate by the one that is supposed to be speaking in the book of Isaiah. So there is a call. A call has gone out to a particular assembly whose shoes latch it. None will be able to unloose because they are appearing with force. So much force that by the time you see that land, it is dark. It is gloomy. It is dark and it is gloomy because of the host and their activity that is therein. This reference to the unlatching of the shoes, the, the latching of the shoes, it is a reference to the darkening of the land by an assembly, not in the same sense of that locust, because the locust 
are the reason for that land being darkened. This is the darkening of a land due to smoke filling the atmosphere. When you think of smoke filling the atmosphere, when you think of smoke blackening the air, that's a sign of war. That's an illustration or an image of destruction. And that's the connotation that is implied here. The verses from Isaiah are actually pointing to verses from Joel. Same language, same context, same direction, same initiative. Joel chapter 2, 1 through 7. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. The illustration of the latchet, the saying of the latchet, it points to one not breaking rank. It, it, it points to feet so positioned forward, so strong in march, so strong in artillery, so strong in attack, so strong in point of strategy it points to a host fulfilling a particular work against no other people than what it says in verse 1 Joel 2 verse 1 blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain this is an attack against the city and the sanctuary the people more specifically, priesthood. This is an attack against the priesthood. That's why the cry of Joel in all of their chapters is for the priesthood to weep and mourn so that the heathen do not enter in and take their name in vain. This is a call to the priesthood. This placement of the latchet of the shoes in, in the book of Mark that the author is placing in there it is supposed to be a reference to a mighty man of war. To a mighty man of war followed by their host, their strong host, who is to initiate or to execute judgment upon the priesthood. Joel 2, same chapter, 10 and 11 the earth shall quake before them, the heaven shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? This he that is strong, this he that executes that judgment of the deity this he represents the kingdom of god that's why there is a cry in mark of their character jesus saying repent the kingdom of god is near it is the same call that that john begins now the author of mark doesn't illustrate point by point the call that this mark that their that their john is making they don't do point by point. They reduce everything to figurative illustrations that the reader, that the audience has to figure out and has to understand by piecing and placing scriptures together. The main call of this John concerning the one whose shoes latch it, not fit to unloose. It is a reference to a mighty man of war appearing with an army. 
a mighty man of war appearing with an army to execute the judgment that is quote unquote divinely mandated. The kingdom of God is who this is in reference to. The kingdom chosen, I should say, by the God of heaven. The God of heaven hath given you a, hath, hath given you a kingdom and a dominion where all the beasts of the field and everything else should be under it and under you. That is chosen, Nebuchadnezzar. Again, the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. These are all considered the kingdom of the God of heaven, the empire chosen by the God of heaven to rule, to regulate, to dominate, to place into captivity, to execute judgment upon the sanctuary, the holy temple, the holy mountain, the priesthood, the city, the sanctuary of the supposed inheritance of the deity of the Jews. These pigeons just hope and I'm gone, so they can go on with their song. Monkey pops on them is strong, very ain't COVID involved. Itching to scream when they talk, side effects start with a cough. Rubbing off on you with salt, you pigeons belong in a vault. I'm thinking I'm human, I'm thinking you're through. I'm sick as your room, you never noticed it too. And if this music can move, not by your cough or a flu. Give you a boost of amusement, Afro-American loose with... The Jews' deity has called from a far distance their kingdom to execute judgment upon their own assembly. To get a better illustration of what this means, back to Isaiah. Isaiah 13, Isaiah 13, 3 to 7. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of the earth, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. Now, if you look in verse 5, we get the image that the deity himself is going to be exiting whatever divine realm he is in and then doing something on earth we get that image in verse 5 they come from a far country from the end of heaven even the lord so the author is saying that the lord is the one that is here manifesting the lord is is this a divine thing happening and the weapons of his indignation this allows us to know no there is no divine anything there is no deity there is no nothing like that coming from a supposed realm where they are from, to the author's mind, their Lord is represented through the weapons of the indignation. So when they see the weapons of the indignation, they know that that is the Lord, their Lord moving. It's not a physical thing, no physical deities there, no deities there, no deities doing anything. This is all figurative illustration. It is allegorical because this weapon of indignation this is the sanctified host that's why he is called lord of hosts lord of hosts recovers hosts and destroys hosts when it's time for the host to be destroyed the host will be called and this host is a kingdom and guiding this kingdom is one of war particularly chosen whose face is set apart from all the other faces to make sure that that execution and the indignation of that execution takes place according to way that it to the way that it's supposed to isaiah thirteen seventeen gives us the answer behold i stir up the meads against them which shall not regard silver and as for gold they shall not delight in it 
there's our answer. Who are the sanctified ones? Who are these mighty ones? Who are who who is this strong and tumultuous uh, people? Who is this army? The Medes, and it's not just the Medes. In the same in the same context, it's also Babylon. In the same context, it's also Greece. In the same context, it's also Rome. Although Greece's destruction was more philosophical, of which the third chapter of Joel gets into. It's interesting how they all play a part. And the author of Mark, knowing this, because they have lived through this, they have lived through the indignation. They're, they are therefore placing it into their narrative in creative fashion. John's reference isn't simply just a passive reference. It is a reference to one appearing for the purpose of executing the divine, the quote, the quote unquote, divinely mandated judgment of their deity. The one whose shoes are to not be unloosed is the one that is to execute this wrath, is the one whose face is set apart from all the other faces in the assembly, who is the leading face, who is the leading mind, who is the leading figure that represents the kingdom of God or the chosen empire of the God of heaven for the purpose of executing anger, frustration, wrath of the quote-unquote deity of these people. When we see that reference, we are supposed to know that. We are supposed to know who the author is referencing due to the way that they are placing their context and the reference therein, of which we will see another sort of how this application applies to that reference, and yet that reference harping on something going on in that day, in that time that's relevant, that is to further initiate or justify the movement of their gospel. This man of war, who is he? We're seeing that the sanctified ones, Isaiah acknowledges are the Medes. So that host whose shoes will not the latchet won't be broken they won't break they won't break their rank uh, before them in front of them in front of them the land is is the garden of eden meaning that it is completely plush when they are through when they look behind them now the land is completely desolate this is a kingdom chosen by the god of heaven to execute quote unquote divine justice against violators and specifically, the priesthood, the priesthood, the city and the sanctuary. And this assembly, this sanctified host, they are led, they are led by an individual. Isaiah 45, verse 1, Isaiah 45, 1, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaf gates. The gates shall not be shut. There is a theme within the Bible. That theme within the Bible is that the anointed, the anointed of the deity is the one that executes wrath. The anointed is the Messiah. The anointed is the Messiah. The Messiah is only positioned the narrative within the scriptures, the Messiah is positioned only to execute wrath. There is a Messiah for wrath. There is a Messiah for philosophy. From Genesis to Malachi. Messiah for wrath. Messiah for philosophy. In a sense, both are wrath. The philosophy of the other is, is wrath. And the wrath of that chosen empire is, is indignation. They are both the same. Their context is different because their realm is different. Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3, 12 and 13. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Another example here. The anointed, the one that is anointed to execute the wrath of the deity, is the Messiah, is the Cyrus, is 
the Nebuchadnezzar concerning philosophy and its impact on the Jews is the Alexander the Great, is the Rome. In this point in time of which the author of Mark is writing, because they've lived through it, they understand that Joel's vision has been fulfilled in their time. The history of what Joel is talking about has repeated in their time. They know the Messiah has arrived. They saw the work of the Messiah. They saw the work of the anointed, the anointed individual of the chosen kingdom of the God of heaven to execute, quote unquote, divine justice, divine wrath against the host, against the assembly of the deity. They're seeing it and little bits and pieces, they're giving it to us, the most blatant being, the kingdom of God is nigh, repent and believe the gospel. This is a connotation to the Joel, priests, repent, ministers, repent, kingdom of God, back to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, the kingdom of the God of heaven hath given you kingdom, glory, and a dominion. The chosen empire is the kingdom of God, the one that is to appear, the chosen empire to destroy violators, and throughout the Bible specifically, the host of the deity of the Hebrews, this is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is always led by an anointed. The anointed Cyrus. The anointed Nebuchadnezzar. Isaiah chapter 10. The anointed is the king of Assyria. This theme plays its part. This theme plays its role. The author of Mark is placing that scene concerning the shoes and the latchet into their narrative. And, and allowing their John to voice that. Because they know and they want their John to convey the message that the Messiah, that the anointed, that the kingdom of God, although it has already come in their day, they're scripting it as if it has not yet come. They're voicing the kingdom of God in what they are saying in the one leading that, that crew. Ever wished you could master a new skill from the comfort of your home? Skillshare offers thousands of courses taught by industry experts. Whether you're into design, writing, or photography, there's something for everyone. Discover your passion with engaging, hands-on lessons. They are accessible anytime, anywhere, with a paid subscription. Perfect for creative minds and budding entrepreneurs alike. Get inspired by real-life projects and connect with a vibrant learning community. Why wait? Start unlocking your potential today. Sign up for Skillshare and dive into a world of endless possibilities. Because we are sponsored by Skillshare, click the link in the description below and get 30% off on membership. Begin mastering your creative journey today. So by referencing that shoe latchet, the author of Mark wants the mind to go to the prophecies of Isaiah and of Joel and of the others that mention the same sort of context because the author is scripting into their narrative the appearing of the kingdom of God. Again, we have to remember that they tell us when this takes place to begin with. They open their chapter giving us the history of when this gospel takes place. It takes place when Jerusalem has suffered double for her sins, 70 AD. After that point, now the author's reciting history they are reciting history through their characters. The history they are reciting through their John, it's already history. The first couple verses tell us the introduction of John takes us back into the time before that happens when there is a minister going around with a mission and an agenda who is connected to the deep state and also to a particular priesthood of the deep state whose mission is to devour a specific land darkening plague at that age which land darkening plague is promoting and marketing an Israelite religion devoted to a dying and rising deity. Along with that, they're trying to promote, they are trying to promote the idea and the history of what has already taken place and of what will after the ministry of this, their John, by giving key references to certain things. That shoe latchet is a reference 
to the anointed that is to appear for the for the destruction of Jerusalem. That one that is mightier, that one whose shoes latch it is involved, they are that anointed. But there's another thing that that shoe latch it represents in, in context. Turning to the book of Ruth, Ruth 4 and verse 7. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing for to confirm all things. A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor and this was a testimony in Israel. The reference to that shoe latchet, it can also mean that this John understood that there can be no better redemption of Israel than a redemption of through the one that is mightier than him. There can be no greater redemption for Israel. There can be no continuing epic of Israel other than through the one that is mightier than him, who is also, in another context, associated and assigned to title, quote-unquote, anointed. Continuing in Ruth, Ruth 4, 8 to 10. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he, so he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Mahalon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Mahlon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses this day. Through this one figure, the one that is mightier, the one that is to be mightier than that John that is to come after. There is to be a great redemption. There is to be a great redemption. There is to be a great purchasing. A great redemption and a great purchasing of Israel. There can be no greater redemption. There can be no greater purchasing than the one that should come after him. Now, the author of Mark is assigning different characters and different character traits to the one that should come after him. In one sense, as we have seen, they are assigning to the one that should come after him the wind of the West, the doctrine of the West, Serapis. And within that one that should come after him, Serapis is within them. The spirit or the son of Serapis is supposed to be placed into the one that should come after him. At the same time, the author of Mark is assigning to the one that should come after that John, the anointed, the anointed of the deity, the anointed of the deity's kingdom, which anointed kingdom is Rome. So the author of Mark is placing different illustrations into this one character because as you go throughout the book of Mark, this one character that they illustrate and have so many traits and composite characters within them, the book of Mark is a book of scenes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are a book of scenes. Mark begins this trend. Depending on where you are in context, the initial trait character that is brought out in the first chapter within the specific character will come out. The character will manifest depending on the scene. So the author is fixing different characters to one character and introducing such so that by the time you're going throughout their book, you're going to see different scenes appearing that register with history and that register with figures in history. They're not deviating from history. They're simply adding fiction to it. And by adding fiction to it, by keeping the history straight, the record is what the record is. We just have to be able to read the sign to understand the history that they're pointing to. It's really interesting, it's really creative, and the agenda that they're getting out there is an agenda that is situating their narrative for a particular audience that knows and that cares to know and that cares to have a specific history hidden concerning their movement 
within characters, known only to them, but to those outside, who knows how it will be interpreted as we now see in 2024.